today, we went to Horn of Africa. This is the latest restaurant from Suzanne, who is by far the most interesting and the most hospitable restaurateur in Houston. Suzanne is from Ethiopia. She fled Ethiopia on foot, trying to escape a civil war. Refugee services brought her to Holland. Dealing cards brought her to Vegas. Romance brought her to Houston. And her love of refugees brought her newest restaurant, Horn of Africa, to the international neighborhood of Gulfton, which she says is home to more than 47,000 refugees. Last time we came to Lucy's, your other restaurant, and you kind of came out and just very nonchalantly shared your story. Uh, and it started with something about walking out of Ethiopia. You're gonna take I know me it goes back way back. 30 years back. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, it wasn't really a good story, a sad story for me, yeah. But um, 30 years ago, as we all know, 80, 86, 87, we was starving in Ethiopia, and it was a uh, civil war going on. So most of my family was killed by the war. So I was like, you know, um, 21, and uh, married, um, little kid, he was five years old, my son, that mm. time. Uh, at the end, I decide how long I'm gonna live. I'm gonna end up in jail or they're gonna kill me. So one day, I tell my mom, my mom, she say like, well, you gotta take the risk because they're gonna kill you like your brother or sister. So I walk, uh, I start walking from Tigray, which is North part, and then, um, the freedom fighters, which they control all the ruling area and the countryside, I end up, after one day walking from the city, I met the freedom fighters, which they protect you. They can take you away to Sudan. That's the neighbor country. By daytime, you cannot walk or you cannot take any car. There's nothing because the camouflage they use and at night we have to walk all the semi mountains and then uh, all the animals, snakes, uh -huh. everything. Daytime we have to sleep in the bush. So it took me like six and a half months to get to the border. At the border it was like UNHCR, Red Cross, waiting for the refugee to come because the starvation was like, some of them they go to Israel, some of them they go to um, uh, fighting with the guerrilla fighters or go back to Sudan. So I end up in shelter, the NHCR, they give you a little tent, rice, floor, everything, so blanket. And uh, they interview us, they know that we are not really armed or something, so they process as what's your name you know we don't have any ID we just get paper and then we wait in the refugee camp at the border of Ethiopia and into Sudan they call it what the hello and six months to get processed to go to the Khartoum I end up in Khartoum I remember it was August okay it was really really hot Sudan <laughs> really hot strange language uh, I'm Christian and then I don't speak Arabic and uh, different food so I get together with the you know the Ethiopian community we always look at each other so I find people they came before me so there is no self on that time uh, so I was living with them from the Ethiopian community then you have to go to a refugee organization in Khartoum. They have to write you down. Either you got to be picked by United Nations, by uh, USA or Canada, Australia. But I was um, picked by uh, Netherlands, the Dutch organization. So <clears throat> that was 89. They pay for the ticket, they finish all the paperwork as a refugee documentary. I end up in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam is really the, the most friendly people you can meet. And at that time, uh, my social worker, she say, what are you gonna do? Well, main thing worries me. I wanna, I wanna call to Ethiopia and then I wanna talk to my son. That's what I wanna do. So they make contact. 
I talk to my son, my family, they know that I'm safe. And they say like, uh, do you want us to help you with your son to get here? Oh, I would love you. So there was like a Catholic charity church in Amsterdam. The nuns, they uh, get communicated with Addis Ababa and then uh, they did all the process. They get my son in 2091. Even they brought my sister with him to take him from Frankfurt to everything. And then I, I had my son. I started living in Holland as a refugee. And then I get accepted. A status was really a good refugee. And I remember I, they used to tell me, can you explain to school to school what is war, you know, what's the refugee? So mm. I used to do that voluntarily. My English was better than others. So they gave me apartment, welfare, money, everything was like best life. <laughs> so I lived there for a long time. I started working in restaurants as a salad girl, which is beautiful, I enjoy cooking. And then the chef said like, can I train you to be my assistant chef? Okay, oh, this Cafe de Yarn is really the best. In Rembrandt, playing that street, the big cafe. I was working there for a long time. I become chef, assistant chef, cooking fast and, and learning everything. One summer, my cousin in Las Vegas, she said like, have you ever think coming to visit us? I have money now and then I'm living good. I brought all my family also when I was living in Amsterdam. I brought my brothers, sisters, pay under the table, get them out from the war, you uh -huh. know. But by 2000, by 1992, uh, they, we become free from the Communist Party. So in uh, 99, we came to, um, to Las Vegas to visit my cousin. And then um, the minute we walk from the airport, <laughs> my son <clears throat> saying, I'm not gonna go back. <laughs> Whatever you think, Holland. <laughs> I'm gonna stay. This is real life, you know, all the lights, everything. Say, so, we can't live here. I'm already Dutch citizen, and then um, we have beautiful life there. So why do we have to come here? <laughs> and now, uh, after a while, one month, I really get love at Las Vegas. Went back to Holland. He stayed with my cousin. He went to school, high school in uh, Clark County in um, Nevada. And um, went back, I gave the apartment I used to have from the government, and then I said, like, I'm going back to the United States. <laughs> Came to, I decided, and then they did the union family paper, everything, so I was accepted for green card, start living, and I said, like, what am I going to do here? I'm a cook, but uh, I, I what, what kind of job? Uh, they say, if you want to make money, you got to be blackjack dealer. Wow. I never gambled. There, there is casino in Las Vegas, but in, um, I went to school uh, for a dealer, mm -hmm. shuffling everything. This guy, he came, he was looking for dealers, attractive girls, whatever he was looking. He said, like, uh, where are you from? I'm from Ethiopia. What's your accent? Where, where you been? I just moved from Amsterdam. You know what, we're looking for, do you speak French? I'm to pay. Yeah. Do you speak Arabic? Yes. So we are looking for multi-language people, so we open in Paris, Las Vegas, we want to hire you. So like, what? Even I don't know how to pay $5 blackjack. <laughs> so <laughs> I get hired in Paris, Las Vegas. The, in six months, everything changed. So I start making money, living American dream, and then I bought a house 2001, and that's it. Living good life. And uh, in the same time when I was dealing, because 2008, 2006, five, the economy was bad, so I have to make another money. I was driving limousine. I drive limousine and then uh, I was picking customers. I was lining in the airport. I worked for CLS company Wednesday afternoon. Today, March 8th. And um, this guy, he came, I'm looking for driver. Larry, my manager, say, she's in line. She's the first one to go. So I took this guy from the airport. 
he was like, you know, talking, talking, talking. So like, sir, I gotta drop this car because the next shift starts four o'clock, uh -huh. and I have to drop you at Rio, where he was. No, I'm not gonna go. Drop me somewhere and pick me up with your own car. I, like, I can't do that. <laughs> but I did. He insisted, and then I look at him. He's a really nice guy. I drop him a coffee shop, and uh, I went to the yard, dropped my limousine, came back, picked him my Toyota Corolla car, picked him up, went to Rio, have a coffee. We talked, we talked. <clears throat> it was March 8, 2006. And the next day, he said like, uh, well, I gotta go to home, because I'm working tomorrow morning. So I went, I went to the yard the next day, uh, Larry say like, Susanna, you book for the whole day. So like, okay. Well, you gotta go to Rio to pick Mr. Gary Grant and then uh, you drive him the whole day. So like, okay, went there, I was laughing. I said like, wow, what I'm gonna do the whole day with, you know, driving in Las Vegas. He booked me for the whole day and then we start dating. We get married, I'm living with him. Today's our 12th year's anniversary. We're gonna celebrate. Today, wow, Today. congratulations. Yeah, thank you. 12 years, March 8, four o'clock. Wow, what a story. So from that day, you know, he said like, I wanna date you, we gotta see each other, I'm serious. Even though he's like 13 years older than me, I was like, you know, wow. How many men, they come to Vegas and date you, you don't see them again. And I was really like, I'm not really, you know, trusting anybody. <laughs> so he invited me after one month to see his mom and family, and his, he was divorced. Oh. And uh, I was like, you know, this is serious. <laughs> I love that guy. And then uh, we start dating. We get married 2008 here in Houston. We're living happy life. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So, That's part of the show, huh? So when did you start Lucy's, uh, your other restaurant? Yeah, the other restaurants, uh, what happened is we, my husband, he got a good job, he got a good business, and then I was like, you know, I'm bored sitting in the house. I went to community college, but uh, I want to do something because there is no Ethiopian, good Ethiopian food. And um, uh, my husband said like, you're gonna be tied with business. So my son was in Las Vegas. I make him move, she's his wife, the Muna, mm -hmm. my son's wife. And um, I'm gonna put a restaurant which people, they can enjoy the good, real Ethiopian food. And I love to cook, we have to do it. So I opened 2012, I signed the lease. And uh, 2012 in August, we opened that one. And we're doing really good there. So, for for those who haven't been to Lucy's, Lucy's has a very kind of high class type feel. It's its own restaurant on the side of the highway. Mm -hmm. uh, has a lounge side of it. The decor is amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now here we are, kind of sitting in Gulfton. Yeah. And so when someone told me that Suzanne started a new restaurant and it's in Gulfton, I said, wait. How? Well, yeah. What, what's behind it? Yeah. So what is what what inspired you to start a restaurant yeah. over here? Because it has um, a completely different feel. Different this, feeling. Yeah. I came with the idea, people, they want to buy the injera, which I was looking to make the bread, because we don't live without the bread, and it's hard to make it. Right. And most of the customers, what I have, the Ethiopian Eritreans, because Lucy is so fancy clean, some of them, they go buy shoe or dress to come in. They don't I feel see. comfortable. It's too city. Too, too clean, too nice. So most, 47,000 refugees, they live here in this area. How many? 47,000. Refugees, refugees of all backgrounds or uh, Ethiopians Ethi specifically? Uh, no, Sudanese, Guinean, Kenyans, okay. Ethiopian, Eritrean. They live in this apartment complex, especially Lanto. So, uh, well, Mexicans also, of course, many Mexicans. And uh, all of them, they say like, um, we love the food, but uh, we we can't we can't come there on in daily basis mm -hmm. because it's too fancy. You've been to Lucy. So. I will. So, yeah. So I say like, wow. If that's the case, 
let me make it cheaper price because that's more expensive for mm-hmm. them. Let me make it uh, the way Africans we live in back home to make them feel good. They can watch TV and then they can do laundry and then I put it together. I was lucky enough to get this property by itself. I open and uh, we sell 10,000 pack, no, 1,000 pack a day in Jira. 1,000 packs yeah. of injera. injera. How many is in a pack? Uh, nine. So the lady in the back, the so three So you sell 9,000 pieces of injera, pieces injera a day. Yeah. Wow. Because uh, nobody lives without this. Right. The injera. It's like rice, staple bread. So they have to buy the bag or they have to eat here. Most of them, they're going to come. Especially at dinner, we make lists until the lady she make it, if it's finished. It's one thing about the injera. Besides what we did is, we uh, most of them they mix it up. Like this one is mixed it up, the one we sell it for thing. The one we sell it is pure teff, pure teff. Okay. So people with the diabetes. So teff is the wheat that you make the injera from, The injera. Right? If you mix it with uh, barley, this one is mixed with barley, a lot of people, they want to buy that one because it's more, all the doesn't stay in your body. So we sell that in the weekend. We have to tell them, you know, around six o'clock on Sunday, we're almost done. We don't have injera because we cannot storage it. Hmm. So it, it becomes successful, this one. I love it. I, I spend more time here because seeing friends, young people, refugee, they come here and they eat. This one is like $11 for the whole thing. 11. Mm, the full breakfast stuff is five ninety nine. Yeah. Anybody can afford it, especially the singles. Yeah. So it's good. Wow, that's interesting. I do like the new location and the new feel. <laughs> it really feels part of the community here in, it is, in yeah. Gulfton. Uh, so you're so it's not just a restaurant. You're selling. Are you selling the teff itself? We sell teff. We sell coffee. By the bag. Yeah. And coffee. We sell okay. coffee and the jabana, of course. Everybody want to make uh, the coffee. Right. The pot. In some spice, I put it there. We're not done yet because I want to divide it. This one's really strictly grocery, mm-hmm. and then restaurant. We're not, we are still working on it. Okay. We're gonna do that. So Just, tell us about the the food that we're eating here. Oh, uh, this is the vegetarian sampler. Uh, the spicy lentil, split pea, and color green, which is fasting season right now. Everybody ordered that one. It's uh, fast. We are fasting for Eastern right now. Okay. So the chickpea and this one is the most selling. And um, the herbs, it's, it's one spicy, non-spicy. Uh, for those they don't fast, they eat that one. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and it's cheap. It's cheap and flavorful. What well, flavorful it is. Yeah, yeah it's very flavorful. Yeah. 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 You, ca- you gotta eat. I will eat. Yeah. I'm just going to pull from the plate here. What was your inspiration for this place? Because I imagine that you have a memory in your head that was the foundation for this one. For this one, um, I know a lot of my people, they suffer having good food in the morning, especially the single. So I I dream about the young guys, they can come in the morning. We open 8 o'clock. They can have the Ethiopian breakfast, which is food, the gypsum, the egg, everything for less than six dollars. And um, at the same time, selling the bread. The injera is the most selling stuff in this place. If we don't cook the whole day, it's okay. We can cover with the injera. Wow. Yeah. So you're trying to mother all the single, lonely boys who can't get to mom's food? Yes. <laughs> That's the dream, yeah. <laughs> It's also amazing that that's six dollars, though. Yeah. Like if you go to McDonald's and you get a, like a breakfast sandwich and a hash brown and a coffee, that's six dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm appalled that you know that, Stephen. I don't know it. I just assume. But like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's amazing that it was that cheap. Yeah. You get two bread, you know, and um, yeah. I could change this one to Mexican. First, I was like, you know, can I do it? Pizzeria, because it's the perfect place for a pizza. But I am not selling to my people. It's going to be Mexicans. Mm-hmm. 
and there is a lot of Mexicans here, so why let me target the Africans? They need it, they need it. So do you have any future restaurant ideas in mind? Oh, yeah. I don't want to tell that one to my husband. <laughs> he will get mad. <laughs> yeah. So is your son still in Las Vegas or is he moved Yeah, he's here. I have uh, three grandkids. His wife, she works in the morning. He works in the afternoon. He manages Lucy. We're all here. And then a lot of my cousins from Amsterdam, they follow me too. They're still working with me. You make yeah, it sound so easy. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's easy. If you love your family, if you're positive, you can make it. Hmm. So, opening another one, my target would be in Heights. Hypothetically. <laughs> <laughs> Me town, Montrose area. I, I live closer to <laughs> the Heights, so if you could like. This isn't a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> the Heights, yeah. That would, that would help me. <laughs> yeah. What would you say is the single thing that made, made all of this possible? Um, vision, good management. Vision. I got the vision, but you have to manage it really good. The employee, everybody, everything, you got to put it together to stay. The restaurant business is hard. Mm -hmm. really hard. So would you say that that experience in Amsterdam, working for that guy, was the game changer? Yes, yes. What gives you that one is you know the secret of how restaurant manage their food, how to be fast. I can chop like a, like a machine, because you have the experience. And um, you know, uh, you have to make a schedule for which food sells fast, which one stays longer, what temperature you gotta put it, all the stuff, you know, managing Is it. Is he still alive? Do you know? You know uh, you he him? sold it. He's, uh, there was three partners, Rene and then uh, Sultan. We went with my husband. One of the partner was there. He remember me. They are busier. It's in a canal. You know how Amsterdam is. But have you been there? Yes. Yeah. It's uh, next to. My wife's twin sister lives there. Oh yeah, cafe uh, Hotel Europa, next to it. I know what it is. So my husband, he want to see it uh, for Konig Duck, uh, the Queen's birthday. We went there two years ago. Mm -hmm. So we sat there, and then I went to the kitchen. Some of the kitchen guys are still there. Oh, wow. Yeah, still there. And then I was like, oh, wow. I bring you a lot of memory. <laughs> hmm. A lot of memory. Uh, so, um, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from uh, working, dishwashing, salad, everything. Oh, God, yeah. The old days looks beautiful. <laughs> young and we have to party at night time. I will add something <laughs> to what you just said. Uh -huh. You are evidently a very humble person. Thank you, thank you. I would never guessed that you have all of this experience and all this life just by seeing you. I know, thank you, thank you, yeah, I did. I've been through a lot. Sounds easy when you say it, but yeah. I've been through a lot. Yeah. Have you ever met anybody here in Houston that you knew back in Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. What was your reunion with them like? Oh, um, well, um, I mean, uh, Ethiopians were everywhere now because we are refugee everywhere mm -hmm. because of the war. And you see them, you know, some of them, they are in good situation. If you talk about the, you know, young age and, you know, when you went to school, all the stuff, war together, you know. Yeah, I meet a lot of people yeah, from the same school. I know, you know, every time I watch the news and you see something catastrophic happening, you always realize, you know, 10 years from now, people from this event are going to be coming here to the United States, but to Houston. Mm -hmm. Houston takes in more refugees than any other city in the country. Yeah. Um, you know, right now, uh, Gerardo is from uh, Venezuela. There's a lot going on in Venezuela right no, now. I know, I'm I so have, sad, uh, yeah. I have a lot of Venezuelan friends and they tell me 
you know, the stories of what's going on, the desperation, trying to get out. Exactly. So. Exactly the one, the way you are now, waiting, lining for a bread. I mean, Venezuela is the richest country. And we've been doing that. They was killing us also. I lost like four brothers in a war. Yeah. yeah. The whole city. My tribe was the biggest target. And we are in power right now, but you know, after you sacrifice a lot of people, unnecessary. Unnecessary, right? For nothing. Yeah. For How nothing. much do you think tribalism played as a big role in that war? Oh, really big time, especially right now. Mm -hmm. After 25 years in peace, and um, we're back to the tribal problem right now in Ethiopia. Uh, the South, they want to be independent. They was part of Ethiopia. And they're killing people from the other tribe. Our previous government, were, they want to rule as Ethiopian, one Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. And even King Haile Selassie, he, he, he did that one as one tribe and one country. But now, after the economy is doing good, the war was over, people, they want to behave. This is my tribe. This is my religion. It's ridiculous to see that, yeah, for nothing. So we go back to the conversation we were, we were having before, <clears throat> and that's the single biggest potential objective to have, mm -hmm. how to help break the tribalism through those networks that you were talking about. Yeah. So <clears throat> a lot of people don't know about Ethiopia. I'm, I'm, you know this, mm -hmm. of course, but... Uh, Ethiopia was one of the first Christian countries, mm -hmm. uh, and it was also one of the first places where Muslim prayers were said outside of Saudi Arabia. So at one point wow, during yeah, Muhammad's yeah, lifetime, yeah. Uh, persecution got really, really bad. So he was his family business was based around um, creating hospitality for people coming doing pilgrimage. At the time, that was filled with idols. And so he came preaching that there's only one God, and so his family started persecuting him and his followers. And so they headed across the Red Sea to Went Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Wow. Yeah. So it's one of the first countries for both Christianity and um, for Islam. Yeah. The first time they say Allahu Akbar, it was in uh, Tigray, Wukro. Now the Turkish, they were investing a lot of money to build that mosque and uh, everything to make yeah. it like Medina. You mean currently the Turks are there? Currently, the mosque. Most for Muslims at that time, Muhammad flew there with his followers, and we are the first Christian in the, in, in the whole world. Uh, but, well, in the whole world, but believers and uh, the King Sheba uh, with Solomon relationship makes us tie with Israel. So I don't know. I'm not historian, but it's it's something about that place. Ethiopia. It's a beautiful country. You make this place better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, Suzanne, thank you very much for taking time for the interview. Um, I know we were all just super fascinated by hearing your story last time, and I think this time as well. Um, I'm really glad you're here in Houston. I love Lucy's. I've, the food here is just as fantastic, and I love the environment here at Horn of Africa. And so I hope your store takes off, your restaurant takes off. Uh, I like it that you're here nestled in this community with all the refugees and trying to kind of provide that sense of home for them. You know, we always think of hospitality as being about food uh, and feeding people, and that's part of it, but I think a lot of it is creating a space for them. And I think you're creating community here among the Ethiopian refugees or other areas that might feel at home with this food. Thank you. So I think that's really great. Thank you so much, too. Thank you. Yeah. For having me here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having well, us. Thank you for having us, for sure. Yeah. Keep coming. Thanks so much. And for making yeah. this. <laughs> there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed sitting in on our conversation today. Be sure to try out her new restaurant. You can't go wrong with Horn of Africa.